Okay, we're in the book of Judges. We're in chapter 9. I'm going to read from verse 7 down to verse 21. And it should be of significant interest, I believe, to all of us because it's the first recorded parable in the scriptures. And so we're just going to use that as our title today, uh, the first parable. And so beginning in verse 7, it says, And when they told it to Jotham, he went and stood in the top of Mount Gerizim, and lifted up his voice and cried and said unto them, Hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, Reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, Should I leave my fatness wherewith by me they honor God and man? and go to be promoted over the trees. And the trees said to the fig tree, Come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit, and go to be promoted over the trees? Then said the trees unto the vine, Come thou and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees. Then said all the trees unto the bramble, Come thou, and reign over us. And the bramble said unto the trees, If in truth ye anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Now, therefore, if you have done truly and sincerely in that you have made Abimelech king, and if you have dealt well with Jeroboam and his house and have done unto him according to the deserving of his hands, for my father fought for you and adventured his life far and delivered you out of the hand of Midian, and ye are risen up against my father's house this day, and have slain his sons, threescore and ten persons, upon one stone, and have made Abimelech, the son of his maidservant, king over the men of Shechem, because he is your brother. If ye then have dealt truly and sincerely with Jeroboam and with his house this day, then rejoice ye in Abimelech, and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come out from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and the house of Milo, and let fire come out from the men of Shechem and from the house of Milo and devour Abimelech. And Jotham ran away and fled and went to Beer and dwelt there for fear of Abimelech, his brother. And perhaps just one other scripture I would like to read, because I do believe that it gives a, a tremendous insight into what is going on in this chapter. And that is from the book of Philippians and chapter 2. In verse 3, Philippians 2, verse 3, it says this, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. And I was thinking this morning as I was reading over and just getting my heart prepared for this session, just what a smelly chapter this is. The stench of the flesh just comes off the page of the text. And so it's not a particularly pleasant chapter, but I believe it's very instructive and hopefully will be a warning to all of us and uh, instructive uh, to our walk with the Lord. And so, as we said, it begins with this parable, uh, the first parable in the scriptures. And of course, it uses trees as uh, uh, kind of symbolic of men. And of course, we know that that's uh, not unusual. Uh, we see other examples where this parabolic form is used. We saw when Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of this great tree of which all the fowls of the air nested in it, and then it was cut down, just a small amount left, a stump left at the bottom. And of course, uh, Daniel uh, had the difficult task, uh, easy to tell him he was the head of gold, but much more challenging to tell him that he was that tree that was about to be cut down. And uh, yet he was able to tell him that this parable was speaking of him. And so it, it is used in scripture, uh, trees as a symbol of men. Uh, we, we see others in Mark's gospel, chapter eight, verse 24, where the blind man uh, was 
been healed by the Lord Jesus. And he said he saw men as trees walking. And then, of course, the, perhaps the most popular one and the one that we're most familiar with is Psalm 1, verse 3, uh, where we, we talked about the, the righteous man, uh, the man uh, the perfect man is a man like a tree standing by the rivers of water. So certainly all of these are uh, kind of a common, if you like, picture using uh, trees to symbolize men. And so when you notice just the key words in, in this particular parable, uh, the one phrase, reign thou over us, is mentioned several times. Uh, you see it in verse 8 where it says the trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said to the olive tree, reign thou over us. See it again in verse 10. The tree said to the fig tree, come thou and reign over us. Verse 12, then said the trees unto the vine, come thou and reign over us. Verse 14, then said all the trees to the bramble, come thou and reign over us. And of course the bramble said to the trees, if in truth you anoint me king over you. And so, uh, the idea is this, that the trees are looking for someone to reign over them. And then another kind of key word is the word promoted. Uh, verse 9, again, it says, uh, at the very end, it says, and go to be promoted over the trees. We see it again in verse 11, and go to be promoted over the trees. Uh, verse 13, and go to be promoted over the trees. So, so come and reign over us, and the idea of being promoted. Of course, we know from Scripture that promotion comes neither from the east or from the west, but from the Lord. But here, we, what the problem we have in this chapter really is we have somebody who has practiced what we call self-promotion, promoting himself, pushing himself up. Rather than being promoted by the Lord, uh, he has promoted himself. And again, as we consider this, I just want to throw this out as I was meditating on it again this morning. But reign now over us, just reminded me of the words of the nation of Israel when the Lord Jesus came and presented himself as the true king. He didn't come in self-exaltation. In fact, uh, he came in meekness and lowliness, uh, in all humility. But they made a definite choice, and they said this, we will not have this man to reign over us. And it seems to me the most fruitful person that ever lived that could well be symbolized uh, by these various trees, the, the olive tree, the, the, the fig tree, the vine, uh, all beautiful pictures in a sense of the Lord Jesus and the beautiful fruit from his life. And they said, no, we will not have this man to reign over us. And instead, they chose a bramble. We have no king but Caesar. And so uh, there's application even as we look forward to the Gospels here. But anyway, let's break in and notice the first tree that is invited to reign over them. And again, we said, basically, they'd already said previously to Gideon uh, in chapter 8, they wanted him to be king, and he refused kingship. Although, as we saw, uh, that uh, towards his latter life, he started acting a little bit like a king. But nevertheless, uh, he refused kingship. And so he was the fruitful person, in a sense, that's kind of pictured in the parable. And they, uh, they wanted him. He refused uh, to take that position. And so now the bramble is willing to fill in and take that place. And so it begins with verse eight, the trees went forth in a time to anoint a king over them. They said to the olive tree, reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, should I leave my fatness wherewith by me, they honor God and man and go to be promoted over the trees. So we start with the olive tree. Refusing to give its fatness and blessing for the short-term gain of being promoted over the trees. And so in other words, it was content to fulfill its purpose. Uh, and that, of course, was to honor God and men. And of course, it tells us uh, that the olive tree, uh, it says, whereby me, they honor God and man. And so we think about the olive tree, and of course, it's what it produces uh, the, of its fatness is olive oil. And, of course, that was used significantly uh, in the scriptures uh, in different ways. It was used to honor God uh, because it was used, for instance, in the keeping the, the lampstand 
uh, uh, the lights shining in the lampstand. And so it was honoring God in a sense that it was uh, showing light on divine things. It was also honoring to man because prophets, priests, and kings were anointed with oil. And so they were honored in a sense when that anointing oil was put upon them, meaning that they were set apart for God. It's kind of interesting what the Bible has to say about the olive tree. I want to just look at a couple of references, uh, just general references. Psalm 52 would be a place to begin, and verse 8, as we meditate on the olive tree. It says, but I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. And so... Uh, the psalmist considers himself, David, like a green olive tree and uh, in the house of, of God. And so it, it pictures, I would suggest to you, at least in there, that, that of dependence, David's dependence, uh, that he was like that green olive tree. Psalm 36 and verse 8, and the olive tree is mentioned. Psalm 36 and verse 8 says, They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the rivers of thy pleasure, of the fatness of thy house. And again, it refers to fatness here in <clears throat> reference to the olive tree in Judges 9 and verse 9. And so I would suggest to you that uh, the picture of the olive tree symbolically is that of the place of dependence and of course um, oil in scripture and particularly olive oil is a beautiful picture of the holy spirit as we well know who speaks not of himself but delights to honor the lord jesus and we certainly should desire uh, to live a life of dependence upon the holy spirit so that we have ministry that is both a blessing to both God and our fellow men. And so I believe that a person that is dependent on the Holy Spirit, certainly his life will magnify uh, God, uh, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, because uh, people will recognize that he is dependent on the Spirit and what is being uh, done through his life is coming from the Spirit. But also it will be a blessing to men in every way, shape, and form, uh, because a, a spirit-led, spirit-empowered ministry will certainly bring much blessing to men. And so we notice, too, that there's no sense of seeking a place. That he doesn't want to go and be promoted over the trees. And again, I, I believe that a man who is under the control of the Holy Spirit will not want to elevate himself. Uh, that's a product of the flesh. And he will not want a place. He'll just want to simply serve and be a blessing to both men and to God in every way that he can. And so, again, what a beautiful lesson for us. Uh, are we, as it were, connected to the olive tree? Are we those people that are known for our dependence upon the Lord? Uh, we're not seeking self-promotion. Uh, we're seeking to live a fruitful life that will be a both, both a blessing to both men and God as we depend on the indwelling heavenly guest, the Holy Spirit. And then verse 10, it says, the tree said now to the fig tree, come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit and go to be promoted over the trees? So the next candidate is the fig tree. And again, I want to suggest to you that if the, the, oil would speak of dependence. I want to suggest that the fig tree speaks of righteousness. Where do we get that from? Well, if you remember in Genesis chapter three, when Adam and Eve were aware of their nakedness and shame, it says that they sought to make a covering of the leaves from the fig tree. And the idea was that they were attempting to do something. Uh, they were attempting to establish their own righteousness, something that was true of the nation of Israel. Romans 10, when Paul talks about his desire and prayer to God for Israel, uh, that they might be saved. And, and he's, he emphasizes the tragedy that they're going about seeking 
to establish their own righteousness and not submitting themselves to the righteousness of God. And so they're still at this fig leaf business, still trying to, as it were, establish their own righteousness rather than submitting to the righteousness of God. You also see that uh, concerning this fruit from the fig tree, uh, it produces sweetness, good fruit. And so it's, it's very nourishing and uh, a good fruit produced by the tree. And we certainly should seek uh, to be those that are used of God to nourish people. And I'm thinking of the words of First Timothy, and particularly the idea of nourishing people in the words of faith. First Timothy and chapter four and verse six, it says, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine, wherewith thou art, thou hast attained. And so again, our objective should be that we would desire that others would be nourished uh, by the, the words of scripture and built up and encouraged in their faith. So olive tree, We've seen dependence, fig tree, righteousness. And it's interesting just to take that a step further, um, the idea of the picture of, of righteousness. It, Jeremiah 24 is an interesting chapter because it speaks of good figs and bad figs. <laughs> the good figs had submitted themselves to God's government and his judicial dealings and had gone into Babylon. The naughty figs, and I love the way the language puts that, the naughty figs, they were rotten figs. They had stayed in Jerusalem, uh, stuck to the place of privilege and pretension, so to speak, and they were to go into judgment. So, again, we would just say kind of symbolically at least that one speaks the olive tree of dependence, and the second one would speak of righteousness. So then we come to verse 12, and it says, Then <clears throat> said the trees unto the vine, Come thou and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? So now we think of the vine. And again, we know from Scripture that the vine, and particularly the fruit of the vine, speaks of joy. And we've got lots of scriptural support for that. Psalm 104 would be an example where we see uh, this idea of wine bringing joy. And so it says in Psalm 104, verse 15, And wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengthens man's heart. Wine that maketh glad the heart of man. And so it's often in scripture symbolic of joy. And of course, we, we know that, don't we? The fruit of the spirit is joy, Galatians 5.22. And then 1 John 1 and verse 4, John writes these things uh, to the believers that their joy might be full. And so joy is certainly something that God would desire for us. And it certainly, back in Judges chapter 9, uh, it talks about this wine, and it says, Should I leave my wine which cheereth God and man and go to be promoted over the trees? And so why would it say it cheers God and man? Well, part of the offerings that were brought to the Lord uh, in the book of Leviticus and in other places in Scripture included a drink offering. And that drink offering was often poured on top of the burnt offering, and it was a, a, an offering of wine, a libation of wine that was poured out uh, on the burnt offering. And it would, of course, symbolize the joy of the Savior in fulfilling his Father's will, even to death, the death of the cross. And so, uh, again, it would speak of cheering uh, the heart of God, uh, how cheering to the heart of God it must have been to see his son not only willing uh, to be taken up with his will, fully consumed with the will of his father, but doing it joyfully, not with resentment, not with any sense of, uh, of bitterness or whatever, but with joyfulness. And so what a picture of, of true 
cheering the heart of God is that of the Lord Jesus. And nothing cheered the heart of God as we think of the looking down on this human race and seeing the stench of the flesh and of sin arising to heaven. And all of a sudden, there's this life, this life that's devoted to the will of God, always doing those things that pleased him and doing it joyfully. And oh, how that must have cheered the heart of God to see. And of course, he says, this is my beloved son. And of course, no doubt, bringing much joy to the father's heart. And so speaking of joy from the fruit of the vine, cheers, and we've seen both God and man. Interesting that Paul would say to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13, very sobering scripture, actually, and one that should challenge our thinking today. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 13 Maybe that's not the right reference. I'm thinking of reigning before the time. And it's not verse 13. <laughs> but the Corinthians, certainly, uh, that was their condition. Uh, they, they were, they, okay, the, verse 9, verse 8, sorry. Now you are full, now you are rich, you have reigned as kings without us. And I would to God you did reign, that we might reign with you. And so what we find is the Corinthians were living like kings before the time. It's not the time for reigning right now. And they they were reigning and acting like kings in their day. And sometimes I think we can be guilty of the same thing, reigning like kings before the time. One day we will reign as kings and priests with Christ on the earth, but now is not the time. Now is the time for humble service and not reigning. And so as we go back to Judges and chapter 9 and notice verse 14, then said all the trees unto the bramble come thou and reign over us. So these three previous fruitful, uh, prominent and productive trees all had asked to become king and they'd all refused. And now they turn with one uh, united uh, desire, and that is for the bramble to come and reign over us. And notice it's all the trees. So there's complete unity amongst the men of Shechem in wanting this bramble to reign over them. And of course, when they chose Abimelech as their king, the men of Shechem didn't get uh, olive oil, they didn't get tasty figs, they didn't get cheery wine, they got only thorns, which are really fuel for the fire. That's what they got as a result of their choice. And of course, thorns would be symbolic of the curse. It was a, it was a rotten choice. It was a cursed choice. They chose the bramble and said, come and reign over us. And so it says, verse 15, the bramble said to the trees, if in truth you anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow and if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. So what an interesting thing for the bramble to say, come and put your trust under my shadow. Now, when you think about brambles, they're not exactly uh, high uh, trees like the cedars of Lebanon. They wouldn't give much shade. In fact, they're pretty low to the ground. And he should have kept in keep keeping with that. He should have been low to the ground. He should have had a small opinion of himself. But the plain meaning of the parable is this, that it's not the useful trees that want to reign, but it's the worthless trees. The bramble and the thorn bush are the ones that wanted to reign. The spirit of service and humility marked the fruitful trees the olive, the fig, and the vine. They're fruitful. They're productive. They're a blessing. They don't want to give up that blessing just to have a place or have position. But the worthless tree uh, that produces nothing but prickly thorns and, and uh, they just causes uh, rips and tears, uh, it wants uh, to have prominence. 
And generally speaking, we'd say this, that within Christianity, tragically, there's much seeking after place. And, it, and, it's, and it's easy to be infected by that spirit of seeking after place, uh, seeking prominence, seeking a position, seeking to have a name, rather than just being content with lowly service. I found it very interesting in traveling in another country, I won't say where, but it was interesting to me that almost every person wanted to be a big chief. <laughs> and nobody wanted to be a brother in the assembly. Everybody wanted to be the boss. Everybody wanted to have a position, to have their own NGO, to have their own organization. And it just seemed to me so contrary to the spirit of service in the word of God that, that people were just content to be a humble brother in the local meeting. Oh, no, I've got to have a place. And again, it's the flesh. That's what's behind it. Seek great things for thyself. Seek them not is the message that we should be thinking of today. And so this spirit of service, humility, mark the fruitful trees, but the, the bramble had this ambitious spirit and yet produced nothing but thorns and fire and devastation. And so we find from verse 16 to 19, we have a little satire that Jotham gives on ingratitude. And he wants to emphasize that really all of this came about because of the ingratitude of the people of, of Israel. It says, now, therefore, if you have done truly and sincerely in that you have made Abimelech king, and if you have dealt well with Jeroboam and his house and have done unto him according to the deserving of his hands, for my father fought for you and adventured his life far and delivered you out of the hand of Midian. And ye are risen up against my father's house this day and have slain his sons, three score and ten persons upon one stone and have made Abimelech, the son of his maidservant king over the men of Shechem, because he is your brother. If ye then have dealt truly and sincerely with Jeroboam and with his house this day, then rejoice ye in Abimelech and let him also rejoice in you. So notice the emphasis twice it's mentioned is this idea of truly and sincerely. It's in verse 16. Now, therefore, if you have done truly and sincerely, it's mentioned again in verse 19. If you then have dealt truly and sincerely with Jeroboam. Now, what's interesting is that the only other time in scripture where you have these two things together, truth and sincerity, truly and sincerely, is in the book of Joshua and in chapter 24. And let's go back to Joshua 24. And, and what's fascinating is that really this is taking place, as we already have learned, in the same place that Joshua 24, which was the renewal of the covenant with Jehovah when they had come into the land, in the very same place. Remember, uh, there was Mount Ebal, Mount Gerizim, and they were supposed to pronounce the curses and the blessings. And, and they were told this, that day to make a choice in uh, Joshua 24. And of course, the choice was, as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. And the people renewed the covenant there that day. But Joshua 24, verse 14 is where you get that phrase again. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away your gods, which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And so the story we're considering here is in taking place in the very same place, and it's revealing to us what happened because they failed to keep their covenant that they had agreed to in Joshua chapter 24. They had failed to keep their promise to serve the Lord in sincerity and truth. And now they find themselves in the mess that they're in, in, in Judges chapter nine. And so in using the term sincerity and truth, he's reminding them in the very same vicinity where Joshua 24 took place, he's reminding them of their failure to live up to sincerity and truth. They'd failed in their obligations. 
And so he says to them that if you have done truly and sincerely, it was, have you then dealt properly, rightly with my father, Jeroboam? You made a Bimelit king, and if you've dealt well with Jeroboam in his house and have done unto him according to the deserving of his hands, in other words, have you done what he right, rightly deserved? Have you treated him properly after what he did for you? And of course, then he reminds them what he did. My father, verse 17, fought for you, adventured his life far and delivered you out of the hand of Midian. It was he, he, he actually willingly, as it were, jeopardized his own life to save you from the bondage from the Midianites. And have you repaid him properly for what he did for you? Of course, the challenge for us is, it's always good to ask ourselves, is my response, the response of my life, a fitting response for what my Savior has done for me in delivering me, not just from the Midianites, but delivering me from sin and death and hell, is my response to what Christ has done for me, is it a sincere response? Is it a response that's characterized by truth, that is appropriate, that is fitting for such great deliverance? And so he's just asking the question, are you treating are uh, you treating my father in an appropriate way as a result of what he has done? And then, of course, he rubs the salt in the wounds and says, look, look what you've done. In verse 18, you've risen up against my father's house this day, slain his sons, three score and ten persons upon one stone have made Abimelech, this bramble. You've made him to rule over you. And so he now announces a two-edged curse. And so he says, verse 20, but if not, in other words, if you've not dealt truly and sincerely, if you've not dealt appropriately with my father, then he says this, if not, let fire come out from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and the house of Milo, and let fire come out from the men of Shechem and from the house of Milo and devour Abimelech. And so the idea is this, that this is going to basically have a double-edged sword, that, that they're going to destroy each other. Abimelech and the men of Shechem are going to end up fighting each other and causing great destruction to one another. And because the rest of the chapter is going to play out these very events that are pronounced in this curse of Jotham upon them. Of course, in dry weather, brambles are very prone to catch fire and they spread quickly all along their prickly strands and they, they do cause devastation. And so that's the picture here. It's going to show the reality of the parable being worked out. Yes, they had picked this ambitious man to be their king, but it is going to result in great destruction that will come upon them. And so it says in verse 21, Jotham ran away and fled and went to Beer and dwelt there for fear of Abimelech and his brother. So now uh, Jotham has gone into hiding uh, he's been saved. He's been preserved. The rest of his family have destroyed. God always keeping a remnant, but he's gone away to hide. And now he's just going to sit back and watch and see the fulfillment of his parable take place. And so we, we move on now to what we would call the treachery of the men of Shechem. And so notice it says, verse 22 when Abimelech had reigned three years over Israel. I want you to notice that, that the, 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 the results of the parable are not enacted immediately because God is very long-suffering. And so there's three years elapsed, allowed to elapse before the fulfillment of the things that are mentioned in this parable. And notice who's behind this. In verse 23, it says, then God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem, and the men of Shechem dealt treacherously, treacherously with Abimelech. So God waited three years before acting, and when he acted, he's acting behind the scenes. Notice the phrase, then God sent. 
So clearly it emphasizes the sovereignty of God in the drama that unfolds in the rest of the story. And of course, notice it's the use of Elohim. It's not, it's not Jehovah. It's not the covenant name for God that's been used here. But nevertheless, we have God dealing judicially in the situation here. And what happens is he had, he permitted jealousies to take place, which produced factions And these factions produced insurrections, contention, and slaughter. And so God is doing this. He's he's behind the scenes. It's interesting that he's acting behind the scenes. God has been eliminated from this chapter from the lips of men. Uh, We notice Abimelech never mentions God. Uh, Jotham never mentions God. God is not mentioned by name uh, by any individual. He has no spokesman. But it doesn't mean that God is not working. In fact, Psalm 67, sorry, Psalm 76, verse 10 is actually being enacted here. It simply says this, Psalm 76, 10, surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. And so God is actually going to use man's wrath, man's man's own kind of fleshly conduct to accomplish his purposes and fulfill Jotham's curse that has been pronounced. Just want to read a scripture from the prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 45, just for a moment, Isaiah 45. And the prophet says this, and it's kind of an interesting statement that he makes because it sometimes seems this way. Isaiah 45 and verse 15, it says this, Verily thou art a God that hideth thyself, O God of Israel, the Savior. And sometimes God may hide himself, but he doesn't absent himself. In other words, he may not be visible in in front and center, but it doesn't mean that God is not working. We have lots of examples in Scripture where God is clearly working, even though He's not mentioned by name. We think of the book of Esther. God is working behind the scenes constantly in the book of Esther, but God's name is not mentioned, but he's active. And we're going to see here that God is working here. God sent this evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem, even though his name is not mentioned on the lips of any individual. uh, People have turned their back on him. They're they're worshiping Baal uh, en masse, and yet God is still working behind the scenes. And I want to just say that, that this week, uh, a brother shared something that, which I found was very interesting and really encouraged me, actually. Uh, he, he shared from uh, the story of First Samuel, uh, one that we've covered ourselves about when the ark was taken. And he mentioned that, you know, if you, if you just look at that, that whole story, uh, the ark is taken by the Philistines, the high priest is dead, the high priest's sons are dead. And if you look at it, it looks bleak. And Israel have no idea what's going on in the Philistine cities. But God is working. God is working in a marvelous way. Uh, Dagon is falling over. Uh, his, his hands are falling off. His head's falling off. And then eventually the Philistines send uh, the ark back to Israel. And they have no idea this is happening until they look up one day and they suddenly see the ark coming on this cart towards them. And God worked in a marvelous way. And it was all hidden to the eyes of the Jews. And I was thinking uh, as I was challenged by what this brother said, and that is this, that scripture says, Second Corinthians 5 verse 7, we walk by faith not by sight. And also Hebrews 11.1. 1. And again, let me just read it to you. These are verses that came flooding into my mind as this brother related this story uh, from 1 Samuel, that sometimes from our perspective, all we can see is bleakness. All we can see is uh, failure, failure of men, failure in the house of God. We see all these things and we, we, we don't see what God is doing. And Hebrews 11, one says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 
And so just a, a good reminder to all of us that God may hide himself, but he doesn't absent himself. And he is working in our world today. We know he is. It's still the age of grace. His spirit is still at work. He's still striving with men. He's still at work, even though we might not see much with our physical eyes. It doesn't mean to say that God is not working and how, how we need to have faith, to, build, to walk by faith and believe him, even when all we see around us is bleakness. Now, of course, the question here, God sent an evil spirit. Is this referring to some demonic personage or simply God allowed bad feelings to develop between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. And I suspect that that's what's in view here. He just allowed resentments and bitterness and jealousy uh, to develop between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. And it's so easy for those things to occur, isn't it? When we, we second guess what other people are meaning or what they're thinking. And if we're not careful, th that bad spirit can develop uh, amongst the people of God, a spirit of mistrust, a, a spirit of resentment and envy and jealousy, and all of these things can easily develop amongst God's people. And, and so God sent this evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. In past occasions, God had intervened for his people in mercy to deliver the people because they cried out to him. But you said this chapter, there's no evidence of them crying out to God but he still intervenes. But this time he's intervening in judgment. And so although God is without a spokesman, he's still in control and he took steps to punish the men who flouted his laws. Even though for three years, everything seems fine, God is still bringing about his judgment because the word of God is so clear the way of the transgressor is hard, and what a man sows, that will he also reap. These are universal principles, and God is going to work according to them. And notice it says, <clears throat> God sent this evil spirit, verse 23, verse 24, that, in other words, we're getting the reasoning behind God allowing this to happen, that the cruelty done to the three score and ten sons of Jeroboam might come and their blood be laid upon Abimelech, their brother, which slew them, and upon the men of Shechem, which aided him in the killing of his brethren. So all of this is allowed for one purpose, and that is to bring about God's divine justice for what was done to Gideon's sons. So men sometimes think that they've got away with things. But God's justice will always be vindicated. And it's good to remind ourselves of that. There's a lot of evil going on in our world today, incredible evil. And sometimes it seems that people get away with it, but they don't. Do you remember Psalm 73? The psalmist was just devastated by the prosperity of the wicked. And it seemed like these wicked people flouting every law of God and, and have no time for God and even shake their fist at God and, and their arrogance is just intensely arrogant people towards God. And yet we, we, we read the psalmist, he's devastated. He said, how come these people are getting away scot-free? In fact, they're living charmed lives. And even when they die, they seem to die charmed, peaceful deaths. And then in Psalm 73, God allowed him to go into the sanctuary of God. And it says, then saw I their end. And all of a sudden, <laughs> everything changed. And he realized that God's justice will ultimately prevail. And people do not get away with it. There is in the words of Billy Sunday's famous ser sermon, there's payday someday, and justice will be enacted. And by the way, I don't know about you, but I am thankful that justice prevailed against my sin. I didn't get away with anything. My sin was punished, but oh, how thankful we should be 
that it was punished in that loving substitute, the Lord Jesus, who stood in our place and in our stead and took divine justice for our sin in his own body on that tree and allowing us uh, to know forgiveness and not only forgiveness, but our sins and iniquities, he will remember them no more. Oh, how we should rejoice in that. But here we see that <clears throat> certainly what a man sows, that will he also reap. And certainly that's happened here. Uh, th th that the cruelty done to the three score and ten sons of Jeroboam might come and their blood be laid upon Abimelech and their brother, which slew them, and upon the men of Shechem, which aided him. So they're aiding and abetting this murder, and they also are going to pay the price. God often makes the instruments of men's sins the means of their punishment. And let me say that again. God often makes the instruments of men's sins the means of their punishment. And so what we're going to see is he's going to use the, the treachery that these men used on the people of Gideon, uh, the, the descendants of Gideon, he's going to use that treachery that was inherent in their hearts to turn upon one another. So he's still using their, the, the, their sinful natures, in a sense, as instruments of punishment upon them. And it's interesting, too, that sin in itself, although it's pleasurable in the beginning, ultimately sin brings with it its own punishment. Bible talks about it being slavery, enslaving, people enslaved by their passions and lusts. And, and it is a terrible thing. Oh, how we need to learn to see the exceedingly sinfulness of sin and to see it for what it is. So the men of Shechem had broken faith with the sons of Gideon, and now they're about to break faith with Abimelech. And so there's constant treachery. And so how did they go about this? Well, it says, verse 25, the men of Shechem set liars in wait for him in the top of the mountains, and they robbed all that came along that way by them, and it was told to Bimelech. So basically they set bandits on the highway in various trade routes into Shechem, and the object was of ambushing both Abimelech and his men and certainly taking their goods. And it was certainly would have caused hardship uh, due to trade being affected, caused men to doubt uh, Abimelech's ability as king uh, to control his own territory. And so we see that this is their strategy. Uh, they set basically men to ambush uh, and to, to hinder trade uh, in, by having them at certain key points on the highways. And so then we read verse 26. It says, And Gael, the son of Ebed, came with his brethren and went over to Shechem, and the men of Shechem put their confidence in him. Now, Gael uh, means loathing. Fancy calling your child loathing. <laughs> uh, I don't know whether uh, they didn't want this child or not, but he's called loathing. We know very little about him other than he was an individual who roamed about with his brethren looking to exploit political instability for his own ends. He's another ambitious, carnal man, just like Abimelech. And that's why I say the stench of the flesh in this chapter is just unreal. And it all comes down to the same thing. Men seeking a place, men wanting to be great, seeking great things for themselves, men who are exalting themselves, men who have a high opinion of themselves, just like Abimelech. He's a bramble, a bramble. What is a bramble? Low to the ground. He should have lived low to the ground, but instead he elevates himself and says, come on, you know, kind of rest under my shadow. And so he, he's got this high opinion of himself. He's puffed up. And now here's another one, Gale, that comes on the scene, just exactly the same, an opportunist, a smooth talker, the ideal politician seeking uh, to take the place of Abimelech because he realizes Abimelech is no longer flavor of the month, and this was his chance to become the flavor of the month to the men of Shechem. And we see how fickle 
the men of Shechem were, in verse 26, Gael, the son of Ebed, came with his brethren and went over to Shechem, and the men of Shechem put their confidence in him. And the men of Shechem certainly don't come out of this chapter with great credibility. Uh, they, they're willing uh, to, to change leadership and always choose the wrong man. Uh, their ability of putting the wrong man in office is, is remarkable. And uh, so now they go after another man, Gale. They abandon Abimelech. And again, they, their fickleness. And doesn't it remind you of the fickleness of the human heart? One minute, they make Abimelech king over them. Then he's not popular anymore. And now they want another king to reign over them. And they want this man, Gale. And the tragedy is that we see the fickleness of the heart of men so often. We see it most clearly at Calvary, don't we? When Jesus rode in his triumphal entry, they're saying, Hosanna to the son of David. And there's, there's great enthusiasm wanting to make him king. Then tragically, within just a week, the same mob, veins sticking out in their necks, are saying, crucify him, crucify him. We will not have this man to reign over us. Oh, for loyalty, true loyalty to the Lord Jesus and to godly shepherds who are not men who are seeking a place, but men who are seeking to do a work for God in a humble way. Many lessons to learn, but our time is gone. We'll have to pick this up, Lord willing, next time. Amen.